This Sony soundbar is a newly launched product within the more budget-friendly S-series lineup of home theater products from Sony, which sits below the premium A-series from Sony. But the HTS 2000 sits right at the top of the S-series and is edging dangerously close to the A-series in terms of performance and features. Now, if you are considering this soundbar and you landed on this video recommendation while researching on the Sony S2000 soundbar, let me give you an upfront summary. Now, consider your budget, and if you are landing right around the asking price of this soundbar, it is a solid contender. Now, this is a new product, and the price is not quite fixed yet, but it should land around the price of the Sonos, this is the Beam Gen 2, or the, hmm, here you go, the Bose Soundbar 600. Now, the Soundbar on its own pushes out an unexpected level of bass, and the simulated surround effect is rather convincing. Now, there are opportunities to add on compatible RS3S surround speakers from Sony itself, as well as the SW3 or SW5 subwoofers for better surround performance and bass performance. But I have to say that if you aren't going to add on the extras, the soundbar on its own actually presents a rather solid performance. Now, I'll very quickly go over the feature set before I round up the upfront summary. Now, this soundbar supports Dolby Atmos and DTS-X. It has HDMI eARC port at the back, as well as an optical input port. Now, it will connect wirelessly for Bluetooth as well. This is a 3.1 soundbar with dual subwoofers built in. There's the Sony vertical surround engine and the S-Force Pro surround engine to handle simulated surround. Now basically, all the computational audio enhancement available to the higher-end A-series home theater products is right here in this soundbar. Now that should give you all the information that you need and rather you can read about it on the S2000 soundbar online. Now, I'll be talking about the design and the construction of the soundbar as well as the software that it works with. And finally, I'll be going on to discuss my own personal experience with the soundbar and how it performs for music and movies. Now, let me start with my general thoughts on the market positioning of the Sony HD S2000. Now, when you're so deep into soundbars and audiovisual stuff like I am, it is sometimes pretty easy to pass over products that falls below your budget. Now, fall below your budget as in you normally consider products that are uh, maybe thousands of dollars and you ignore what is marketed as budget or entry level offerings. And more often than not, years can possibly go by without you ever paying attention to the product segment that you have ignored. Now, Sony has a venerable A-series home theater setup. That includes the A3000 and the A5000, both of which I've reviewed, as well as the A7000 soundbars and the very, very impressive A9. But Sony is a consumer brand that spends the entire market catering to the lowest of the budgets, to the highest tier of customers willing to spend thousands of dollars. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Sony product lineup for home theater, they also have an S series, which sits below the A series. Now, if you are on this channel, there's a high chance that you are used to spending good money on your AV setup for movies and music. And no one will blame you for being unfamiliar with the Sony S series lineup. Now, I'll give you an example, right? An idea of what the target market of the S series is. Now, you consider a full 5.1 setup in the S series, and this is the HTS 20R. Now, the soundbar comes with rear speakers, although it's wired, and a subwoofer. And the entire setup costs 300 Singapore dollars. That converts loosely to about about 200 US dollars. So just let that sink in for a moment. A full 5.1 setup that costs less than one Sonos One speaker. A few days ago, I received a loaner soundbar, which is this HTS 2000 from Sony. They might have picked up on my hesitation a little bit when I mentioned that it might not fit into the rest of the content of the channel. And the response for me was, you know, just play around with it, see if you like it. And they told me that it will pair with the RS3 surround speakers and the SW3, SW5 subwoofer. That those are being used for the A3 soundbar and that 
got my attention. Sony is surely, slowly but surely, pivoting towards a mix and match ecosystem where a consumer can choose from a compatible surround sound speaker and subwoofers. Now this was the direction that Sonos took right from the start and Bose is another manufacturer that also got into that. And that is good news for consumers like us where we can then choose to keep certain components and upgrade parts of it to our liking or buy according to our budget. So I would say that the HTS 2000 is going in the right direction. So next up, we want to talk about the design and the construction of the soundbar. The HTS 2000 is a relatively long soundbar. It is 31 inches wide here, just over two and a half feet, right? And this has the advantage of being able to throw a wider sound stage rather than having sound come from a much narrower foot print. Now it is half a foot longer even than the Sonos Beam Gen 2 or this Gen 1 and a couple of inches wider than the Bose Soundbar 600. Height-wise, they are all pretty similar and you won't have any problems trying to fit them below the TV even if your TVs are not wall mounted and are on stands. Now the Soundbar itself has five drivers. There is a center driver which will deliver vocals and I think you can see it against the light. Uh, maybe it's just right about here. Okay, the vocals are delivered with good clarity. The left and the right drivers for stereo and surround projecting um, sounds are actually going forward and they are at the far ends of the soundbar which means to say they sit at least two feet apart from cone to cone. Now the interesting thing about this soundbar is that it houses two powered subwoofers. Now these are not passive radiators, they are active powered subwoofers. They are also ported and ducted, right? These ports at the sides of the soundbar, they are the ports for the subwoofer itself and they sit flanking the center channel driver. Now the magnets on those subwoofers are substantially bigger than the other three drivers and the bass performance is really surprisingly good. Now the soundbar itself doesn't have any upward firing drivers nor side firing drivers for surround but the heights and the surround sounds are actually pretty uh, convincing and well simulated, projected very very well. Now, now, around the back of the soundbar, there are only two input ports and a power inlet. So these two are the input ports. There's an HDMI eARC port and with a TV with eARC ports, you will be able to then connect um, just one HDMI cable, control the soundbar volume up, down, power on, off, or control via HDMI CEC. Dolby MS Soundtrack will play through the HDMI eARC port from the TV to the soundbar itself. The optical port can then be used when you are using an older TV screen or a computer with optical port outputs. But optical ports won't deliver Atmos quality sounds. You have to bear that in mind, there's not enough bandwidth to it. Now, the power to the soundbar is actually supplied by a power adapter. Let me try to pull out where the power adapter is. Okay, so this is the power adapter. It goes to a two pin uh, socket and comes out. This is a brick. Now, this is the first sign that um, it is actually a budget soundbar. So the first and only sign that points to the S2000 being budget. It is not that DC is a bad thing. DC is um, has a cleaner power supply source, if you might say that. So uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that most high-end and audiophile equipment, they actually have a direct onboard power supply as opposed to having an external power brick, which maybe seems a little bit cheap. Now the unit comes with a small and handy remote control. This is actually pretty cute actually. Look at how small this is. Now you can control, uh, you can power on and off. You can switch inputs between HDMI, optical and Bluetooth with the remote. You can turn on the sound field. You can turn on the voice enhancement. There's uh, There are ways to adjust the volume up and down as well as the bass levels. And you can also mute and turn on night mode using this remote. Remote. Now, if you don't have the remote, there is software. So next thing we're going to be talking about is the software. The Sony soundbar works with the Sony Home Entertainment app. Now, that is a different app, I remember, uh, from the A-Series app. Now, that is available on both Android and iOS devices. So if you aren't keen on using the remote for whatever reasons or you lose it, the software replicates the entire remote control through the app 
and then some more. Now the setup of the soundbar cannot be easier, literally, right? After downloading the app and accepting whatever terms and agreement that you're supposed to accept, it will then start to search for the soundbar. So you just have to power the soundbar. The soundbar was detected with ease and the app will then prompt you to move your phone nearer to the soundbar. So you just have to put it somewhere near the front right of the soundbar and the soundbar is then paired and added to your app. That's it. It is that simple. Now you'll be able to then change a few more settings like prioritizing sound quality over the wireless connection if you have the wireless speakers uh, paired to this as well. You can also toggle the sound processing within the soundbar, adjusting AV sync and uh, some other system level setting. The app itself is pretty clean, pretty easy to use. But one thing you will note that it is missing EQ. Right, so there's no EQ setting on the Sony S2000 soundbar. Now, there's a way to adjust bass levels through the subwoofer, but that is limited to three levels minimum, maximum, and the in between at mid. Now, I set it at max because the other levels are just too low to be uh, interesting. It makes the bass performance actually quite poor. But on max, it is actually what will blow your mind. Now you will then notice that you can't actually adjust rear levels. If you don't have rear speakers connected like this one here, you will have that rear level setting grayed out. Now going into the wireless speaker connection settings, you will then be able to add a pair of wireless around as well as wireless sub from Sony. The only wireless around that will work with the S2000 soundbar is the RS3. For subwoofers, both the smaller SW3 and the larger SW5 will work. So after you set up the rear surrounds and you get the sub set up, you can also then go into the speaker positioning menu and set up the distance and the volume levels of the surround. The one feature that is missing in this S2000 soundbar is auto tuning. There is no mic on the soundbar itself, so no voice assistant as well. So it won't be able to listen to the test tones and set itself like the soundbars in the A series. Now, if you are buying a soundbar for music performance, you might actually be rather disappointed. Now, first off, the form factor for stereo music usually dictates that each of the left and the right um, channel, they are a good distance apart. In terms of positioning traditional left and right speakers, you will need to place them in an equilateral triangle. The distance between the speakers should be equal to the distance between the speakers and yourself. Now, this is the soundbar. This is the S2000 and it's not peculiar to this soundbar, any soundbar, right? The left and right uh, drivers, they are going to be really close to each other and in this particular case just two feet apart and you really don't want to be just sitting what like two feet away from the soundbar to form that triangle right uh, and when listening to music you're going to be doing that it's going to look pretty weird so soundbars usually rely on computational audio and a face array arrangement to throw a wider sound stage than is physically possible with the two drivers being so close to each other now this then sounds a little bit unnatural and overly processed now the situation can be alleviated by getting the surround speakers, but the sound stage is then not so accurate because it's not a front sound stage anymore. Now, most of the music that you listen to nowadays would have been mastered and produced in stereo, and the sound engineers would have mixed it for two speaker output. When it gets processed, it deviates from the original intent of the music producer. Now, the second issue is that of bass. Yes, there are two subwoofers which are actually being built into the soundbar itself. So these S2000 dual subwoofers built in are actually pretty impressive. But I have to say, they are impressive because they exceed the expectation of what you can expect from something of this size. But in absolute terms, they will not deliver the expected level of bass for critical listening when it comes to music. Now, that said, this can also be alleviated by pairing a subwoofer to the S2000, which the soundbar allows for. Now, I paired the SW5 because I have it. It is the larger subwoofer from Sony home theater lineup. And the result was truly quite a lot more bass, more than you could ever want. In fact, I had to lower the bass setting, which was uh, defaulted at max when I paired it in, to just about plus two to plus three, plus four maybe, uh, on the settings before the sound uh, sounded more balanced. Now, if you are into listening to music, if you're listening to music on the soundbar itself, it will work for most use cases if you just want to pump some music throughout the room. In fact, 
it, it can get really loud, right? And you won't even usually get close to 50% volume. I settle at about 35% volume for some pretty energetic music sessions. But let's bring to mind what the primary role of a soundbar is. A soundbar's primary role is for movies and for TV watching, right? And in this particular role, the S2000 actually works very, very well. And I'm not saying because I am reviewing this. I'm actually reviewing this because it works well. Now, first thing I did was to set up the soundbar and loaded Netflix to run through my usual gamut of um, Atmos movies, um, most of which has scenes that I'm familiar with, like Extractions by the Head, All Quiet on the Western Front, a couple of them, right? And they're all Atmos coded. The soundbar delivered in a big way. Now, on two fronts, bass and surround effects. Now, first on the base, I did not expect the built-in subwoofer to work this well, but they did work. They really pumped out more bass than what I would normally and traditionally expect in the soundbar format of this price point and size. Now, it wasn't just louder bass, it was truly a lower bass extension, uh, much more than what I'm normally used to from just the soundbar alone. Now, that said, you probably want to leave the bass setting to the max. Anything below that, like mid or uh, low, it actually is sounding way too thin and lacking in bass. It's like Sony should only have one setting, which is max. Now, I had to push it a little further, right? So, I paired the soundbar with the subwoofer down. The SW5 is a large subwoofer. It has an 8 inch driver. It's coupled with a passive radiator. Now, I don't expect most buyers of the S2000 to spend on a large subwoofer like the SW5, but it is an option. You can always get the SW3, which is a smaller subwoofer at half the price. Now, bass was really enhanced, and when the sub is engaged, you probably want to lower the bass extension from max to somewhere in the middle, or else it will be truly overpowering. Now, now the second front that this soundbar excels at is the surround. I did mention earlier that I don't like sound processing applied on soundbars for music. But for movies, that's a completely different story. Now you will want the processing done. The S2000 is an Atmos capable soundbar. And if your TV processes Atmos, like this is the LG CX that I have here, you can connect via HDMI to the EAP port and you will get Heights Enhanced 3D Spatial Audio pumped into the S2000. Now, most lesser soundbars don't have Atmos capabilities, but the S2000 has it and is being executed very well. Now, on its own, I was already pleasantly surprised that the surround sound field went way, way beyond the physical confine of the soundbar itself. Now, I wouldn't say that it replicates the sound at the back of your sitting position, but it does throw out some very convincing sounds to the far left and to the far right. Now, but in this particular case, you will want to make sure that the sound field optimizer is turned on. Now, without that processing, the sound effect will be pretty lackluster and everything seems to just come from a point in the middle of the sound bar. Now, the other effect is that of heights. Atmos tracks also contains height information. Now, again, you want to ensure that Sony's vertical surround engine is turned on in the app. Without that processing, you will miss a large part of the experience. The S2000 sound bar doesn't have dedicated upward firing drivers, right? See, totally blank at the top. All the drivers are facing forward. Now, the heights effect is well simulated. You, you aren't going to be hearing things like physically coming from above you, but it is a good simulated heights effect. Now, the other 3D audio format that is supported on the S2000 soundbar is DTS X. Now, not many soundbars actually support DTS-X, not many budget soundbars, but on the Sony S2000, it does. Now, if you have a collection of Blu-ray discs and then this soundbar should rank pretty high on your consideration due to the fact that it supports DTS-X. Now, there are two notable features that I'd like to bring to your attention night mode and voice mode. Now, you might be familiar with what it does from your experience with other soundbars, but sometimes the effect is subtle, so subtle that to the point that you might be wondering whether it's doing anything at all to the sound. But with the S2000, these two effects drastically changes the sound. Now, night mode takes away a lot of bass. So unless you're watching late at night and you don't want to be disturbing anybody else, you might not want to activate it. In fact, you shouldn't activate it. But know that when you do need it and you do activate it, it really works. The other is voice mode. Now, if you're watching content that isn't coded well or has high dynamic range, you might want to turn this down to focus 
on the voice. The vocal range is enhanced tremendously. The spoken word comes out very loud, very clear. You will likely identify with the issue that sometimes we have to increase the volume to hear dialogue clearly and then the ex action goes off, the gunshot or the explosion kicks in and you scramble, right, to lower the volume in a hurry. Now, with the voice mode turned on, even quiet passages with dialogue will allow voices to come across quite clearly and distinctly. Now, Sony is a company that develops a lot of its own technology and along with that, they think up a lot of tech jargon to name and explain what it actually does. Now, there's the S-Force Pro uh, front surround, there's the vertical surround engine, there's the DSEE, there's the DRC and there's so many more. It just makes the product feel gimmicky. But whatever the intent and purpose is, it ended up making the S2000 soundbar a very competitive product. So if you're in the market for a soundbar, do give the Sony S2000 a listen. I review a lot of other audio products on my channel too. And if you are keen to check out what else I've done, do check out one of my videos that YouTube is suggesting to you right here. And I will see you over in that video.